I kind of was a bit resentful of that. And I just thought, well, we'll take what comes, you know. Um, I always like when, I've got Wendell Berry's poem about how to be a poet stuck up on the wall in my little writing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, say, it says, uh, you know, accept what comes from the silence, make the best you can of it. And, um, <laughs> so, so I didn't kind of come on with high expectations, but I was very relieved and really quite excited to discover that all, although uh, all my friends were practicing social distancing to my regret, my muse is definitely not practicing social distancing. She's really become quite close and intimate and is constantly whispering in my ear and prompting me. So I've written a lot. So I started off my first, I mean, I wrote a little villanelle about walking round and round in circles in my garden, but that was the first one, which is quite a low poem, you know. But then I was talking again about the antiphon. I found myself rereading uh, the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. Uh -huh. It's a wonderful Persian poem, which is all about how all you need to do is be in the garden with the beloved, you know, here, uh, with a with a uh, here with a loaf of bread beneath the bough, a book of verse, a flask of wine, and uh, and uh, and thou besides me singing in the wilderness, and the wilderness is paradise. You know? So I started writing this thing, which I thought was just going to be like I called it quarantine quatrains because it's written in the exact same quatrain verse form as the picture. But I found myself. I mean, let's give you some samples of it and just play it. In the end, it turned into a poem, I'm not, fear not, I'm not going to read it all, a poem of 40 quatrains, which was just because the word quatrain, a qu quarantine rather, quarantine, they're called quarantine quatrains, quarantine caron is 40, originally quarantine was 40 days, or well, we're way past that. So I started, I'll just read you a few sample verses. Yeah. So it started with this, this idea we probably all had, that, oh wow, this is going to be really cool, I'm going to have deep leisure and, you know, <laughs> And that's before we discovered Zoom. So I'll read you some opening bits and then I'll read you. Like me interrupted you. I'll read you the Zoom bit. <laughs> so it started off like this. Awake to what was once a busy day, when you would rush and hurry on your way, snatch at your breakfast, start the grim commute. But time and tide have turned another way. For now, like you, the day is yawning wide and all its old events are set aside. It opens gently for you, takes its time and holds for you whatever you decide. This morning's light is brighter than it seems. Your room is raftered with its golden beams. The bowl of night was richly filled with sleep and dawn's left hand is holding all your dreams. Mm. So that was the only part of your dreams on hold. So then I wrote a few more verses like that. And then of course, um, suddenly Zoom. <laughs> zoomed into my life yes and uh, i i i realized that it's you know there's an extraordinary ambivalence about the zoom experience isn't it yeah. like it's great to see you again andy I know, but I like know. where are the tacos <laughs> and, <laughs> and you know the clinking of the beer glass yeah, so, yeah. um I, i'll read you some zoom verses <clears throat> some days i am diverted by a call the soft computer chime that summons all to show a face to faces that we meet. Mirages, empty mirrors on the wall. Alas, that all the friends we ever knew, whose lives were fragrant and whose touch was true, can only meet us on some little screen, then zoom away with scarcely an adieu. You know? <laughs> so, um, you know, I did quite a bit in that poem about the sheer, the beauties of it all, about the intensity with which one hears birdsong. And I, I thought it was going to keep going like that. And then as I was coming towards the end of my 40, and tragically, these numbers we hear on them, you know, the, the numbers yeah. of the water yeah. were growing. They are mind-numbing numbers. Mm -hmm. And in the end, I felt I wanted to end with elegy with lament, I do think that's an important, you know, I don't want to write just monkey dinky little poems that make you feel good. I mean, I do want, I have hope and I want to share it. Sure. But like the psalmist, you know, you want to do it from within knowing the pain. Anyway, I just really wanted to capture the experience. I don't, we don't hardly ever watch TV, but we listen to the radio each evening. And this voice on the radio just kept calmly telling you these hundreds and then thousands. And trying to imagine, you know, the the, the tragedy and the truth behind those numbers. So um, 
Uh, it's a slightly more extended ver version here. It says just, this is the final six verses, but maybe it'll ring some bells with you guys as well. Um, certainly my experience. And it's also kind of tribute to the carers, to the, to the people on the front line. And it finishes with, with prayer. The, the whole poem, as I say, is kind of quite secular, but I just, it lifts into, into prayer and particularly prayer for the departed. So I'll read it to you. Section seven. At close of day, I hear the gentle rain, whilst experts on the radio explain mind-numbing numbers rising by the day, ciphers of unimaginable pain. Each evening they announce the deadly toll, and patient voices calmly call the roll. I hear the numbers, cannot know the names behind each number, mind and heart and soul. Behind each number, one beloved face, a light in life whom no one can replace, leaves on this world a signature, a trace, a gleaning and a memory of grace. All love and loving, carried to the grave, the ones whom every effort could not save. Amongst them, all those carers whose strong love brought life to others with the lives they gave. The sun sets and I find myself in prayer, lifting aloft the sorrow that we share, feeling for words of hope amidst despair. I voice my vespers through the quiet air. O oh Christ, who suffers with us, hold us close, deep in the secret garden of the rose, raise over us the banner of your love and raise us up beyond our last repose. So I'm sorry, it changes the tone of things a bit. No, but it's, no, it's really good. And I, th I, I just, um, I have this, this deep sense that in some way, <clears throat> our physical isolation from one another um, in the midst of all of this and the, um, the sorrow, um, the grief, and the pain. Um, it gives us an opportunity to really embrace uh, this, the, the transcendent gospel of grace and the cross in a way that, Absolutely. that, doesn't, that doesn't make sense when everything's bopping along just fine. I mean, yeah. the, well, the, in the way the real... Uh, grit here yeah i mean in a way i was thinking about you that you know in your book um you know the jesus heist you've got this whole idea that we somehow need to bust jesus out of church a bit and <coughs> let him loose you know on yeah. the streets and i wrote a poem called easter 2020 about our locked churches on easter day i think i sent it to you yeah yeah, yeah. which is just yeah. about exactly that yeah what we have the opportunity to do is to realize how true our faith is all the time, everywhere. 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 Not Sundays yeah. in church. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think it's an enlivening moment. It's uh, um, uh, uh, Fleming Rutledge has talked about the, you know, the, the enlivening of the liturgy of the word that's taking place. I mean, it's, it's just that it, there is an abundant, like resurrection itself. In the yeah. midst of all of the trial and the tribulation and death, suffering and care, there's also a blossoming of a great uh, vision of hope uh, and resurrection that is is budding even even in in the midst of all this. I think. Absolutely, yeah. Do you find? Yeah, so, so. I was just going to ask if, if are you seeing some of that and are, are other people echoing that to you? I mean, surely. It's oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, in one sense, we're all really missing being together and we need to get back together again. But there's been some real creative responses liturgically to this, for sure. A bunch of different people in the Church of England, of whom I was one, although I didn't organize it, put together an amazing watch night liturgy on Holy Saturday with all different video resources and poetry and uh -huh. dance and everything, which this, the, the presenter of Christchurch Cathedral in Oxford actually coordinated it, but the Archbishop of Canterbury was involved in all, you know, it was like a real, and it was interesting, it was a presenter, it was a singing liturgist uh -huh. who suddenly saw the need to do this. 
And it was an immense feat of coordination, but it lasted all night. And it, there's a full video record of it now, but people could come and go into it. And um, there were some beautiful things. And Ali Barrett, who's a fantastic new, you know, hymn writer, um, uh, well, I mean, from my point of view, young woman, him rushing on. <laughs> she's one. She's now one of the chaplains in Cambridge, and she wrote this fantastic um, Holy Saturday hymn. You know, a hymn for the darkness and the waiting and the transition, um, which was like to, to be sung to the tune of um, of Abide with Me. Uh, it was just wonderful. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I think I think the church is going to emerge from this richer liturgically than it was when it went in. Well, and hopefully, yes, we will have a greater sense of uh, the gift for each of us, too, in some way. Uh, so that when we do return, um, there is um, perhaps more intentionality to the relationships. Oh, yeah. Because the, the other paradox yeah. about this whole collective experience is, is the paradox about isolation and connectivity. On the one hand, we're isolated. But on the other hand we're isolated because we hadn't realized how connected we were. I mean, this one little bug starts off somewhere in, you know, China or wherever it was. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Where it doesn't matter where it started. The point is that one person had it. And within three months, it was global. Now, that wasn't global because somebody was spreading a virus on the internet. The only way that virus spread globally was because one person was in touch with another. Now, we've just seen the shadow side of that in the spread of the virus. But actually, the positive side of that, that we belong with each other, that we're interlinked with each other, that we're connected, that we are one body, that Jesus has always taught us that, Paul has taught us that. Yes. We're not seeing just how true that is. And we need to start living like that. Yeah. We yeah. need to start living as if we really do know what John Dunn said in the pandemic of his day, which is that no man is an island complete of itself. Well, mm -hmm. and it makes me think of the wilderness journey of the people of Israel in some way. Not that God my, is. My dog needs to be let out of the door. Of course. <laughs> go on, go on, off you go. So we, we could have had some serious howling in the background. Yeah, right? no, that would have been great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, just a sense of, of what we're learning in the midst of it all and how. Uh, the real test will be in some way, how is it incarnated in our living? Uh, it's one thing to talk about it while we're alone, uh, but, yeah. but do, we, do we learn our lessons well enough to live differently? Yeah. The big yeah, yeah, I wonder if actually on that very point, uh, let me just, um, I had a, there's a bit in the original Rubaiyat, where Omar Khayyam is thinking about the fact that places that used to be really thronging, beautiful, rich courts of Mughal emperors are just grassy ruins now. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. The lion and the lizard keep the courts where Yam shed glory and drank deep. Well, I realize that's, you know, all this kind of rewilding and return of nature. So I wrote some verses about that, but then at the end, I wrote these verses, and this is very much touching on just what you said. Perhaps in all this crisis, all this pain, this reassessment of our loss and gain. Nature rebukes our brief authority, yet offers us the chance to start again. And this time with a new humility, with chastened awe and mutual courtesy, to reaccept the unearned gift of life with gratitude, with joy and charity, perhaps will learn to live without so much, to nurture and to cherish, not to clutch. And if I'm spared, I'll hold the years I'm given with gentler tenure and a lighter touch. That's perfect to end on. Thank you. So I've got two last questions. Now, normally I ask people what they're reading, except that's what this whole conversation has been about. And I ask them what they're watching, binge watching on TV, but you're a radio listener. So I have two different questions for you. The first is, what kind of tobacco do you smoke? Do you like the sweet aromatic or do you like the Latakia, Cavendish, Burley type? Uh, okay. 
Well, there's two answers to that question. Right now, you see I'm smoking in my, my study, which is, of course, in the house where I've got the door closed. And when I'm here, I smoke a, well, it's a kind of aromatic Cavendish. It's a sort of black cherry Cavendish. Yeah, yeah, okay. My, my wife quite likes the flavor of that, but she's not keen on the others. But I also have some, you know, dark, deep, pungent, you know, more, if you like, traditional English mixes. I've got Peterson's Sherlock Holmes, for yeah, example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, and I have those in my little heart. So um, it's a smokatorium, you know. So, <laughs> so I, 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 I smoke the darker stuff in the heart, which is actually also where I do quite a lot of the writing. I have a kind of smoky muse. Yeah. Um, but I smoke the, um, I like these, these aromatic, I get a really nice, there's a, there's a thing called Kendall Black Cherry, Kendall in the Lake District. I mean, not that it's grown there, but that's where it's. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. So I feel it has an association for me with the Lake, lake Poets, and that's what I'm smoking in this. In is this your piece. Peterson your favorite? Yeah, I love Petersons. I'm a real Peterson fan. This is a kind of workaday Peterson. It's one of their system ones. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's fine. It's, it's, but I do have some really lovely Petersons, you know, with real proper silver bands. I've got a, this is a bit of a pride and joy at the moment. This is an original Sherlock oh, Holmes yeah. series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just got the most gorgeous grain. I, I, I treat myself to a pipe, mainly to remember certain things like finishing a book or getting a set of lectures. So I've got a C.S. Lewis pipe, you know, which is when I gave some lectures on C.S. Lewis. And I've got, um, I gave some stuff on talking in Oxford. So I bought this, uh -huh. this is a again, with a, yeah. but this you can see is very much a kind of talking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, that's 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 my talking so the nice thing about those is that I kind of have associations with each pipe. Yeah. Now, the last question is, uh, a lot of us do podcasts or binging TV. You listen to the radio. Do you have a radio show, or is it mostly news? Or... Yeah, um, well, I mainly listen to the, to the news. Um, I'm, I'm not, it's not that I don't use, the, I do watch podcasts, and I also watch YouTube. I'll tell you what I have been watching, and it kind of comes through to my phone. As a fellow clergyman, indeed, fellow bishop of your, from your point of view. There's a wonderful, um, comparatively young and recently um, consecrated English bishop called Andrew Rumsey, who is the Bishop of Ramsden. And he's, uh, he and I, a long time ago, were in a band. We were unbelievably, we were in a, we were in a late 80s band together. Called the really? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> strange but true. Anyway, <laughs> very, very good on the sense of location. And he's always written about parish and loving the parish. And, being, he's a bit of a kind of Wendell Berry kind of guy. Uh, but he has started on the first day of the lockdown. He heard somebody on the radio use the phrase, well, we're all going to ground. Wow. And he started on YouTube, a series that he does faithfully every day, about 10 minutes, sometimes with the guitar and singing, sometimes reading from the Book of Common Prayer, so going to ground. Mm -hmm. And it's just so rooted and so earthy and so full of a trust in the, the way the soil regenerates. So I quite regularly, I mean, I don't look, watch it every day, but then I'll binge watch it to catch up. Yeah, yeah. Andrew, Andrew Ramsey, um, going to, uh, Andrew Rumsey rather, because it's funny, uh, he, he's called Rumsey, he's the Bishop of Ramsden. And one time we also played in a worship together, in a band together, a place called Rumsey Mill. So, but anyway, he's, he's <laughs> Rumsey. Yeah, going to ground. I, I've been really enjoying that. Yeah, I have to look it up. Well, thank you for today. I really appreciate it. And it's been lovely to connect with you even across the pond like this and uh, to listen and read and think. It's yeah, no, well, it's great to connect with you. And I'm glad you found the Spell in the Library series. I'm keeping that going. I, I post one every two or three days. And my wife kindly films it. She's got no desire to get in front of the camera. I wasn't going to ask who it was, but I yeah, think yeah, no, no. tell me. <laughs> no, no. So my wife is your proxy, as it were. I ask her to imagine being one of my friends coming in. Yeah. So say to your wife, imagine you were friends with me. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, no. So, so it's lovely. And it works, works out pretty well. The next one, which I'm probably going to post today, is about G.K. Chesterton's wonderful songs in Wine, Water and Song. Oh, fantastic. Well, we'll make sure we connect people with uh, uh, links on the site. So thank you yeah. so much. Okay, my pleasure. Great to see you.